So, you know, new media, big, big question, uh, what is it? And um, so th this, this sort of became a little bit of, a, of an obsession for me because as I was, you know, I, I was curating this work and I was doing this work myself, sometimes I had to talk about it with people and I found it very difficult to, to really, you know, to, to say what it was. Um, and some people would just tell me like, oh, it shouldn't be, you don't, don't worry about it. it, don't call it anything. But that's difficult when you want to organize a show and you want to say, I'm doing a show that's not about anything. It's a little bit uh, difficult to, to do. So I started doing a lot of research on this. Um, and there's this really amazing writer, Italian writer, who put together a bunch, he put together a book called Beyond New Media Arts. So here he says, the expression new media art, which is deemed inadequate even by those who use it, has turned out to be a particularly resistant one, just like the point of view it embodies. The art that it represents has a limited presence in the world where contemporary art is produced, meaning you don't really see it in galleries, you don't really see it in museums. It rarely appears in shows, museum collections, and magazines where it might sometimes get a little space under the heading, Other Stuff. So if you're interested in new media art, I highly recommend this book because it's, it's, it's really a great reference for this, this, type, of, uh, this type of work. Um, and um, you know, this is another curator who's very active in this sphere um, and she was been, has been trying for years to also try to find better, better terms. And she says, the lowest common denominator for defining new media art seems to be that it is computational and based on algorithms. I don't completely agree, but, but it's, let's say, 80% true. New media art is often char characterized as process-oriented, time-based, dynamic, and real-time, participatory, collaborative, and performative, modular, variable, generative, and customizable. So, in this case, her definition is not great because she's using so many different words that it's not really coming to a conclusion on anything. Um, and then Beryl Graham and Sarah Cook are two curators who have been curating uh, new media art for many years, and they've written a lot about it. Um, and so they say, if we are to consider the issue of the physical properties of the work of new media art rather than its conventions or how it behaves, we would be continually chasing a vapor trail because the physical properties of new media are so mutable emerging, evolving, being upgraded, and becoming defunct. So what they mean is that if you try to understand new media based on the tools that are used, then you're also going to have a problem because these tools are always changing. And you know this is a problem that exists for anybody who tries to curate new media arts, for example, in a museum, is that the equipment that is running the arts is, can become very quickly obsolete. Um, and so, for example, if you have a base, uh, sorry, an installation that's based on a computer that's running Windows 10, in 10 years, Windows 10 will not be supported anymore. So how do you keep this computer basically stuck in time? So there are all these methods of um, trying to understand how to curate these things. But in one way, there is something that's very particular about new media art is that it's, it's uh, something that has to do really with the time that we're in. Um, so another quote from Domenico Quaranta, the, the term new media art is a product of a fierce, almost Darwinian process of natural selection. This has not prevented a number of competing terms like digital art and media art from surviving, oop, or the winning term from being abused by its users. The complicated background of the term new media art reflects both the uncertain definition of the arena it applies to and the weakness of its affirmation strategies. So what, you know, what he's saying is that basically People have a hard time defining new media, but it has something to do with the fact that it's hard to define things more and more today. Uh, finding definition for things to say something is one thing and not something else is something that's becoming a little bit, is, is becoming more difficult. Um, so, you know, here for example is a series of artists that you could call new media, but these are all people that have been working since the 60s. Um, and they've been doing work that if, you know, if you saw a Giulio Le Park today, you could think that it was done today. Um, and the reason for that is that Giulio Le Park was thinking about uh, art and society in ways that are still very relevant uh, in our time. At his time, I don't think people really understood him. So, um, you know, I think this is, this is one of the things that, that, that really got me thinking a lot. Um, and, and, and what is the thing that, you know, if new media is the art of today, um, what is it about today that makes new media relevant? And, and what are the things that new media responds to um, in our culture and in our society that make it an art that people get engaged with so much? Um, and so uh, this, this, I really like this quote by Billy Kluver. 
The function of technology as a material is not to put previous aesthetic concepts into new forms, but to provide the basis for a new aesthetic, one that has an organic relationship with the contemporary world. So in thinking about these, what are our issues of today that new media responds to, um, I'm using this, this cover of this magazine because I really responded well to it. I was thinking about a lot of these ideas of how the world today is like becoming more and more like a soup. Um, in essence, like I would say if there's one term that I feel is relevant for our time, it's blurriness, uh, lack of definition, everything, you know, if you think about people's identities, um, in, in the States, for sure, it's a big thing, but it's becoming a big thing all over the world where people are saying, well, I don't want to be defined by what my birth certificate says. You know, I want to be able to define myself. And same with our culture. You know, we, we are able to make a sort of complete melting pot of everything we want. Like, we can make almost like these infinite Chinese menus of everything for our culture. You know, we can combine a little bit of Buddhism, a little bit of yoga, a little bit of, um, you know, uh, Taekwondo, and then we can go and have sushi, but then we can also go and eat some homemade food that our grandmother makes, and all of this like crazy amount of cultural influence, which is expanded by the fact that, you know, we have access and we're bombarded by so much information, that in the end, you know, maybe we don't really need things to be so clear cut and defined. Um, and in this magazine, they had this interesting metaphor, which was they called the big flat now. Um, and so essentially what they, what their theory was is that so they say the big flat now is the infinite plane on which our culture operates today. Its frictionless surface is composed of the um, is composed of the obsolete hierarchies that have been melted by the internet. Its shallowness belly, belies a seamless texture that allows for a rapid collision of ideas. In a fiber optic landscape, the difference between next door and next continent is a matter of imperceptible nanoseconds. So. You know, I think that that is one thing that um, started becoming very clear to me is that, in a sense, if you're sort of constantly being bombarded by all this stuff and all of your categories of how to perceive the world are being constantly re reshuffled and transformed, um, there's one thing that you need to be able to do is to start developing an ability to judge what, what you can respond to and what, what things mean for you. So I started developing a, a more of a writing practice um, and one of the things that I was trying to encourage my peers, the people who work in my field to do, is to develop critical thinking. And critical thinking, if, you know, for those of you who are in school, in college, you know, it's kind of normal. You, pr you produce a work and then you have a critique. You present it to your other students, to your professors. They look at it, they tear it apart, they give you good feedback, bad feedback. But once you become a professional artist, it becomes very difficult to get you know, because mostly in new media, there isn't like a culture of journalists and publications and critics who look at this work and who say, oh yes, it's valuable for this reason or it's bad for that reason. So, you know, just being able to develop um, ideas and sort of uh, uh, critical thinking around the work that we see and that we make and to be able to dialogue around that with our, with our peers, I think is really important. So, um, you know, all of this thinking that I was having around, around new media arts and specifically this idea that critical thinking needed to be an important part was something that kind of led me to a point where this show uh, came about. Um, so, one, you know, one, one of the things that um, is happening today in, in, in our society that some of you might be uh, tuned into is that um, you know, the art world is going through a little bit of a, of a big shift with what's happening with crypto art. Um, so crypto art essentially is a new field of, of art production where artists are basically producing a huge amount of stuff that, you know, good or bad, but where um, it's all being produced to be sold. Uh, of course, a lot of artists make work to sell it, of course, that's normal, but in general, you, you would assume that if you're making artwork purely to be sold, um, then you're, you know, in a sense, you're, you're, you're not really following a, a, an intention of, of, for the work itself, aside from financial interest. Um, but what's interesting is that the crypto world is really this kind of conclusion of where we've been going with digital art for the last 20 years, because the stuff that is being sold on, in the crypto world belongs 100% in the digital sphere. It has absolutely no connection to reality anymore. So the thing that 
evolved with, for me, from new media arts was very relevant because it involved a physical space and a group of people that had to experience this together to feel it, you know, like, uh, or not necessarily together, but you had to feel that this was a space that was made for people. It's not a space that is made for machines. It's not a space that is made for a single wealthy person that would own it. It was made for a public, right? The public, the commons, let's say. Um, but what ended up happening is with, I think with COVID, because a lot of the type of artworks that needed this physical exposure to people started having to shut down, I think there was an acceleration of a trend that was already happening, which is the digital essentially blowing up so quickly and revolving more and more around itself. And what I mean by that is that, in a sense, um, you know, for, for, for when, the, when the sort of digital tools came out and, and tools that allowed us to make content using digital uh, approaches, we still were reliant on the physical world to capture footage, to edit footage, to do photography. But then we started being able to do everything in, in 3D. The visual effects world became better and better. Uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. In a few years, it's not impossible that you will be able to make a feature film without any humans involved. You can have an artificial intelligence, we'll write the film, we'll create the actors, we'll animate them, we'll edit the film together, and we'll produce it. And there are already some artists who are experimenting with these kinds of things. So what, what, I, what I was really sort of getting very interested in is uh, it reminded me of uh, this, uh, this French thinker that I was very fascinated by when I was in college, when I was in university, uh, called Guy Debord, who he wrote this very important book called Society of Spectacle, and his critique at the time in the 60s was that you know television and cinema were, were growing and becoming bigger and bigger. And you know what, what he was saying is that they were essentially removing us from ourselves. And they were trying to take us out of ourselves and essentially control us. But one of the observations that he made that really struck me was that he said crit real critique, real revolution is impossible. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example. So, we're all familiar with subcultures, and a lot of subcultures during the 60s, 70s, 80s, maybe even the 90s, were all about sort of saying, fuck you to the system. You know, like let's, you know, saying we can create art, we can create culture in a way that has nothing to do with the big corporations, with the big, you know, with museums. We can create these small worlds that are just our own, uh, like punk, for example. But what ends up happening with any subculture that is, uh, that goes against the system, the system doesn't fight it, it absorbs it, it takes it in. And so then you have the Nike, the Nike punk collection, or you have the, you know, everything that's underground, it's great for magazines, it's great for brands, because then they're like, oh, there's a trend, we can use it. So essentially what, what Guy Debord was already saying in the 60s was that this spectacle society, as soon as it sees anything that criticizes it, it won't, it will just, it will just take it in, it will make it part of itself, and that way it'll grow. And this is really what we're seeing with um, the digital sphere, is that you know, if, you, if you look, if you follow a little bit the critique that's being done about crypto art and you know, sort of virtual worlds, it's fine. People are very happy with you criticizing it because it's inevitable. And essentially, the way that it's sort of, the way that you can imagine it is that it's like this, this wave, you know, and it sort of, it starts at, a at, a, at the bottom. There's technology, there's reality. Then there's technology about technology. And then you arrive at this point where all you need is an infinite amount of content that can be generated by machines that can then make memes from that content and they can make avatars to put you in digital worlds. And essentially the, the, the connection with reality is, is almost destroyed. Um, and you know, a very good example of that is this artist that has been selling crypto art for, very, for a lot of money called Beeple. Um, and when you look at his work, it's all about these sort of little allegories of the digital worlds. So really in conclusion, you know, the, the, the sort of the thoughts that led me to creating this show were about this moment in time that we're in now where basically, you know, physical space and uh, art that is about the physical is becoming less important, but it's becoming less important because the digital is becoming stronger. And so in my sort of reflection about this digital sphere being almost like a mythical entity that, that is you know, underneath the surface of reality and that's driving the way that reality is being constructed, 
I started thinking that this idea that, that the digital eating itself was kind of funny. It was kind of comedic. It's like when you hear something on a loop over and over and over, it starts becoming a little bit hilarious because it's like, you know, you, you lose any connection with what's really being said and it just becomes this funny sound. So um, all the ideas that are in this show um, are really about that. It's about trying to represent this like snake eating its own tail that is the digital. And so every piece is really about this idea of reflection or of a loop of something that is connected constantly to itself, feeding on itself, um, and, and really sort of like exploring this, this, uh, these concepts around how the digital is like becoming this, this over, uh, over powerful entity in our, in our time. So that's it. And uh, thank you for coming. Uh, <laughs>